Kenda, Joan, we have go back a long, long time. Kenda must be 95 by now. But uh, we have been friends for so very, very long. And uh, it's a great honour and a great privilege to have you come and share our church today. So, Kenda, you come and uh, you take your time and you've got all the time in the world, mate. Thank you. I want to speak today, dear friends, on seven keys to build the prophetic anointing. Is that okay? Now, I'm not going to talk about the pathetic anointing. I'm talking about something that every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every housewife, every husband, every soul parent, every single person here today, the sound of my voice, can operate. You see, I'm not going to talk about the fivefold ministry. You know, the Bible says that Jesus ascended and descended, and when he ascended and descended, he gave gifts to me, Ephesians 4, 11 through to 13. And uh, he said that he gave the apostle, the prophet, and there's that pointing finger, the prophet, you know, God's feeding hand, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, you know, he's the tall one, and then the pastor, and God puts a ring on his finger because he does all the dirty work, and then the teacher. Five gifted ministries to the body of Christ. I'm not going to talk about the heavy heavyweights. But what I am going to do is talk about keys, how you and I in everyday life can move in a prophetic dimension that's pleasing to God and blesses us and others. In fact, you know, it should be no big deal for us to move in the Spirit. How do know the Bible says the criteria for you and I to be born again is that as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons and the daughters of God. So the characteristic of being a son and a daughter of God is to be led by the Spirit. And most of us believe that once or twice in a lifetime, we may get a sudden flash from heaven and say, you really do, God spoke to me. But how do we know the old saying in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 27, where Paul said, in Him we live, we move, we have our being. And I, one thing that you'll go away with unless you're asleep, is that I want to impart to you the ability for every person in the sound of my voice to move in a spiritual, prophetic dimension. Yes. You may be killing the spots, you may be making jam, we don't make it these days. Or relishes, that's a thing of the past, maybe a few do. Or you may be doing washing your car, fishing, or whatever you're doing. God can speak to you. In fact, I said to Pastor Kendall, the first time I ever moved in the word of knowledge, physical, was in your church, in Gatton. But before that, I was in uh, Toowoomba, and a particular man wanted me to come and join back in those days, and I was looking through some areas and to maybe purchase a house to come over from where we were past me. And I went to use the loo. And while I was in there, there were, there were tradesmen and they were just finishing the finishing touches of this house, this big house. And I got this impression this guy had a, a back problem and he was a tyler. And so I came out and I said to this guy, well, how, uh, you know, because it's one of the first times I moved that way and been in this church, and I said, how's your back? And he says, the blink, and I won't tell you how I said it, the blink, and he blink, 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 he had an operation. Now I was in the loo when God spoke to me, talked to me. And I want to tell you this, that sometimes we get so blue and spiritual about things. We walk through life with dark glasses, big Bibles, bigger than being her, and those type of people scare the daylights out of me. 
that I believe that, that what I'm going to talk about, even though I'm going to use an obscure passage of Scripture, that I believe that God wants to take us to other levels so we can move in the Spirit. Now, I think we offend the Holy Ghost. Do you know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit can be grieved. My wife will tell you this. She says, oh, I feel to go both. And I'll say, don't do it. I mean, Nike, certainly do it. And what the average person, not the, not even the church down the room, road does, they, they get an impression, they put it on the shelf, and nine times out of ten, they forget about it. But if you want to live an exciting life yes. in the Holy Ghost, just do it. Yes. I can tell you here my Lord, I've been in barber shops. And God gave me an impression, you name it, in restaurants, everywhere, in buses, planes, walking the streets. And because I've learned to obey an impression, profound, in fact, I've been even more alive. I'm like, wow. People tell me the circumstances. And I think the reason some of us live boring lives is because we're boring. <laughs> we're just darn boring. Hey, mate, life's for living. Can anyone say amen? amen? And I believe that the path of the justice is a shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. Heard of a man? That's in his seventies, and one thing I, you know, you know, listen, come on now. That spirit has never died. That pioneering spirit. That I remember, Neil. You may not remember this. Well, I came out from New Zealand. We had the first prophecy meeting in West End, I think it was. Is that right? And they've never seen it. And it was myself, Alice Below, and, and David Jackson. And I remember, and I hadn't thought of this for years, and I remember something like this. I said, man, I've been waiting to get my hands on you. <laughs> and then I talked about a Caleb spirit. Can you remember that? And you give me this mountain. You should remember my prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> my son. My son.
But he said, your name is going to be changed to Cephas, a rock. And then he said, I'm going to build my church upon that rock. And how many know that he placed the seed of change? He was a builder. Jesus took people by the hand and he built hope. And I want to say this, dear friends, that don't let the devil say that you're a washer. Don't let the devil say that you're too old, you're too this, you're too that, or you, you lost your hair or whatever. Listen, you are a builder in the spirit, and I believe the best is yet to happen in this house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back. Are you with me? Are you with me? Yes. Turn to the person beside you and said, I think it's going to be okay. For those of you that are taking your notes, would you write this point down, please? Hungry people are humble people. No, I'll give you, I'll give you the first Hungry people, you know, and read the statement. Hungry people are humble people. This pulpit is sort of an interesting pulpit. <laughs> In November, I was in a church in Jakarta. You know, it's not like that ages. Half of it's happened. Have a lot of 20,000 people in the church. And it's really, it's ritzy. And they have a pulpit that have two pedals. One for it to go down, it's evident they have orchestras and all sorts there and performance on stage. And another one for going up. And I'm a little bit like God's fiddler, and I'm leaning somehow like this, and I'm standing on one pen and suddenly the, 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 the pulpit goes down. And then I get all confused and I don't know where, what pound the pulpit's going up and down. So there we are. Ezekiel 37 verse 1 to 4. That's the only Bible verses in this uh, Ezekiel that I'm going to use. Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 to 4. And remember this, dear friends, I'm talking about seven keys to build the prophetic anointing. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in an open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And they answered, O oh Lord, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. I want to quickly read this in the NIV version. The hand of the Lord was upon me, he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and save them dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, you remember... There was a man, the successor of Moses, who heard that Eldad and Medad were prophesied among the people. And uh, he went to Moses and he says, Moses, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying among the people. And in Numbers 11 verse 29, Moses responds, listen to what Moses said. Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put His Spirit on them. Now in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle takes that that Moses spoke of, and he encapsulates it, and he says, uh, you can all prophesy. Now I am not talking about verbal public prophecy. What I'm talking about is the ability to lock in to a realm of the Holy Ghost in everyday life. It is said that in the Christian church, 
in the year, 50 years of pastoring churches, that good Christians get caught up in an investment thing and they lose money. Now, I'm not here to judge other the fact that folk and good people, and I think sometimes it is because we, we get caught away in wins and we, 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 we get caught in peer pressure, but as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Now, my wife and I are not rich, trust me. But I was away overseas. I had a, a long, a, what is it, a superannuation. It's worth about two bucks now. But while I was away, I had an impression to put it into, uh, what was it, a fixed deposit or cash or something, whatever it is. Took it out of the yo-yo and I did it. And how, and it's, you know, the, 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 the stock market crashed. But I was saved from that pain, that moment. And I think in a little way, God wants us to hear His voice. Can anyone say I'm here? And I believe this, dear friends, the reason that we are exposed to pain, sometimes unnecessary, is because we haven't learned to lock in to what I call a prophetic dimension. Can anyone say that? Now, can I very quickly say this? I'm not talking about exclusivity. I'm not talking about, you know, the prophets. I'm, you know, and the verbal side. I'm talking about the ability to move uh, everyday life. So my first key, my brother on the front row, the first key is this. Number one, be aware that God's hand is upon your life. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out of the spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. I believe that this is the beginning of moving in what I call a prophetic dimension. Amen. To realize the fundamentals is that, that God's hand is upon us. The major revelation that God's hand is upon us, irrespective of our feelings, irrespective of what our brethren will say, Irrespective of what churches will say, irrespective of what your past will say, irrespective of what your boss will say, irrespective of what failure will say, I want to say that the number one criteria of moving in a prophetic dimension is to know that the hand of a mighty God is upon you. That every person here is moving under the divine providential hand of a mighty God. And you know, circumstances are like getting the flu. Circumstances are changeable as the wind and the weather. But there is one thing that I believe that, that God has put in your life and my life and we need to proclaim it day by day that the hand of a mighty God is upon us and His hand is not for, uh, against us, it's not for evil, it's for good. Yeah. I can prophesy easy here to this house. I'm not getting any brownie points for saying what I'm doing, but I'm believing it. You're a house of destiny. And don't you look upon this as just a little club that you rent in the hall and, you know, we don't know where it's going to go. I want to say the hand of a mighty God is upon your life. And kneel in no shape, form or shape that you washed up. These are but the beginning of days. And I say this. I say this every ounce of my conviction. I feel good. I feel, hey, I do have a little bit of a prophetic dimension. God have mercy on me. I booked a minister under the Baptist and I've been there four times overseas and they booked me, or I'm going back in May, but they booked me for a week in the year 2016. And I said, Father, I don't believe the rapture, but I said, the rapture would come. <laughs> they said, oh, well, we'll go up with you. <laughs> but the point is this, what is it? That I believe that friends, people are hungry for men and women that are going to spur them along. Hallelujah. The world could be your oyster. And allow the Spirit of God to shake your mind and shake your desires. For I believe we're going to hear from you in the future. Hallelujah. And it's not going to be a piece of bread. It's not going to be walking through the tulips. You're going to buy it. I'm 
You know those days, oh Frank, where are you Frank? Come up. When I used to prophesy, and this is how I used to prophesy, what's your name? And this is how I heard you in, this is how I used to prophesy. Yeah, the Lord shall say, under me, my son, the power of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <The> spit. <laughs> is that right? Yes. yes. I remember back in those days, it's all changed, but women would have these big women pearls. <laughs> And, uh, you know, pay back in those days a lot of money. I won't promise you. And, and I'd get all carried away and singing in the spirit. And I'd be ruffling it here and there. And I see why I was damaging and hearing the word. And I was so enthusiastic in prophecy one day. And I was going like this. And I held it and right across the Oh, those brutal days. <laughs> But I tell you what, they came for more. <laughs> the amazing, am I right, Neil? Today, after the service, five minutes out, they're away. But then were the days when people were hungry and they were spirit to spirit and heart to heart. And listen to me, friends, don't lose your hunger for God. Australia. He trained in that in that gym. 
And Pastor Ross said to him, he could hardly speak English. But he said two things in 1973. He said, I'm going to be a rich man one day and be a film star. And Ross said, well, Arnie, you're going to have to learn to speak good English. <laughs> and how many know that in 1973 he had a dream? And we know that he's achieved that goal. You know, the research tells us that imagination is nine times more powerful than the will. That it is what has turned into light, the law of the mind. What grabs you in your mind, grabs you. You see, in Proverbs, we've heard so many times, it says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The bar computer, you can be talking all the right things. You can live with a person who is negative. You're a positive. Who, who, who wants to bring you down with fear. Vice of male or female. And somehow you've got to break through that. Bring that person to another level. Because I believe this. And you know, the siblings have been pulled back. And many a dream has been dashed on the sidewalks of life because of others. Oh, and since I gave out my church, it's interesting. It's so interesting. These blue classes, they want to they want to shut you up. Oh, you've had your day. Well, I haven't had my day. I want to tell you I haven't had my day. And you know, they want you to say, oh, well, it's time for you to put in retire. Well, maybe it's time for you to retire. God bless you. Go get the ball and do that. And fish, that's wonderful. But I want to tell you, God's given me a gift. And I'm telling myself that for the next decade, hallelujah, I'm going to prophesy hallelujah to the hills of me. Anyone like to say I mean? Visualize yourself moving in the spirit. And I believe it's their friends that you got to, you know, Joshua 6 verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I've given it into your hand, Jericho. When you are to pray, I mean, for goodness sake, don't. Pray boring prayers. The parents are sick of it. God's sick of it. People around you are sick of it. Come on now. Pray prayers of faith. Begin to walk around your Jericho. Begin to see it. Lay your hands on things and, and verbalize. You know, in Kings, I used to lay my hands on the walls of the chapel when you dedicated it. I think we're a bunch of wailing uh, Jews. And I get people to lay hands. Why? Because we're involved and we're engaging. Folk, you can't go to sleep in prayer. Every place the soul of your boots should tread. I want you to notice, he didn't say every place the soul of your feet. Because feet denotes on standing idle, foot. And when you pray, you're moving towards, you're moving towards your goal. You're moving towards creating something in the spirit. You're calling them in. He to say amen. You know, most pastors, and I've been involved in buildings, and couldn't say I'm still on that school board, and we just opened a brand new campus at Pippa Martin, over 11 million bucks. Oh, it's boring, now we're going for another one. That's, that's that fourth one. And you know, I, I know about money and all that stuff, and dying a thousand deaths and all that. But I want to tell you this you've got to call things through. It. Was at the church in Indonesia recently. They paid off four million bucks, American dollars. Beautiful building. And I said to one of the pastors, how did it happen? They'd go out and pray for the unsaved. The unsaved get healed and give a big chunk of money. And I want to tell you what, are those days over? Are those days over? Are those days over? And listen, you've got to get your hands on people. You've got to be bold to say, hey, do you mind if I pray for the miracles in your hands? Yeah. And so number two, you've got to see yourself. I want to call you. I've caught up in the spirit. And so the second thing is see yourself moving in the spirit. Number three, and that is plant in an environment of need. He sat in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Listen, never run away from hard work. You know, commit yourself. The problem with Australia is we want something for nothing. And how many know that as a state we're broke? How many know that we put a, 
in our premier or prime minister, respective what side of the political spectrum you're in, and we want things for nothing but who's going to pay the debt. And I think, my dear friends, that we've got to be planted. If you want to build a house, you want to build a family, you want to build a destiny, you want to build something, you can't be planted. I like long haulers. I like people that stick. I like people that are planted. Their roots go down in the local church. Oh, we're going to see here something. Maybe next week we'll come here somebody else. You're never going to build with those people. But you're going to build with people that are planted. 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 Roots go down. I have a saying, not in my life time, but in my life long. You see, we're genetically building for the future. And you're not going to do that unless you plan. I'm a long hauler. I was 18 and a half years in Invercargill. Saw 750 decisions for Christ for two and a half years in a hall bigger than this. No car. 32 years or 30 years of kings. And I came and go, but hey, I'm a long hauler. I don't like people that stick. I've been married to the same wife for that many years. It's a long time. And the only reason I, I'm young is because I found the secret of, of being young in the Bible. Does anyone know what it is? Paul, you know, your pastor needs to get a hold of it. Paul the Apostle said, I die daily. <laughs> every month. Every month I die daily. I tell you what. This old man, he looks about 95. <laughs> That's not a little trouble. <laughs> Be planted in an environment of need, the mystery of that which was full of bones. You see, dear friends, in John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. If you have your Bible with you, a lot of people don't bring their Bibles anymore because pastors don't refer to the Bible. And I need to bring it to church. And I've said this around the world, take a pen, take something, and where it says in John 1 60 was a man sent from God, put your initial aside of it. Amen. We've got to realize that God has planted us and we are men and women of divine purpose. Yes. Yes. See, I'm planted in an environment of need. There are so many bloody needs. Jesus would move with compassion. You know, they say the church wants your money. Yes, we want it more. Because freely you receive, freely you. What could this church do if it got more money to minister to people? And I want to tell you this, dear friends, that plants an environment of need. And then let's have a look at the next, the fourth one, very quickly. Cultivate a passion to minister to the brokenness of humanity. You see what happened is a bone. Can anyone know what a bone is? A bone is something that resembled something that was a bone. Years ago, my wife and I started, went to Norfolk Island. And that was years ago. There was no blue and TV and I just about wanted to go up the wall and the cows walk in the streets. And it was, I was bored for a while. And uh, so to, to counteract our boredom, we go walking through round the through the cemeteries. Anyone been to Norfolk Island? You know what I'm talking about? This one you can ask that one, that one, that one. But here's the point. And even if you go to a cemetery today, sometimes they have photos of, of the deceased. And you see that was once valued. And a bone is something that represents something in that. A bone could represent, you know, your pastor has a fairly heavy Bible. If that was to be consumed into ashes, he'd have a little handful of ashes. And he lift that hand up full of ashes, but in his mind, that's my Bible. It once had value. And I want to say this, dear friends, that here we are planted in an environment of need. There's so many needs. 
but we cultivate that uh, a, a, a passion. I go to India uh, pretty well every year. I'm a Lord willing, I'm there twice this year. Pretty well every time I go, I take a hundred Australian bucks. It's not much. And I buy, I, get, I change it. It's about a lot of like 35 to 40 times. Like, that's what I call big money. And you know, even the senior pastors chide me. People around me say, oh, don't give, don't give that professional. And I get angry. Uh, because I still do it. Don't you tell me what I can't do and can do with my money that I want to give. And, and the reason I'm doing it is not for them, it's for me. Because for one of the great miracles that Jesus lived among the infirm, he lived among the handicapped, he lived among the poor, and he was still moved with compassion. And you know, society wants to desensitize, wants us to, you know, to watch our TV, so it's blood and guts and murder and... and tsunamis and that, and we sometimes we no longer move because we've lost the passion, the compassion. And I want to say this, never lose the uh, passion to minister the brokenness of humanity. Give me your answer. Never lose it. Go back and take, ring someone up, visit the hospital, be led of the spirit. Go, we're going to we're renting a house, we're building another one, we've only been there a few minutes sort of thing. And last week we had the neighbours in for three and a half hours. And we're going to do it. What would you in the area? Reach out, just have fun, talk someone. And you just never know. A miracle could happen. And I want to say this. You know, uh, cultivate a passion to minister the brokenness. In Ezekiel 3 verse 15, I sat with I sat. Now, uh, you probably don't know this, but I have a ministry called Healing and Hurting Hearts Ministry, coping with grief and crisis. Without a shadow of doubt, I had over 100,000 registered attendees. Just recently, I was in Jakarta ministering to relatives, Christians, listen to this, of that Malaysian airlines that went down from Surabaya through to Singapore. 165 people lost their lives. 92 were Christians. And the sooner we realize that God doesn't put us in a glass coffin for Texas, and the better we're going to be. You know, we know we don't know. You see, faith, these died in faith. Was, and every, pretty every day I'm ministering, and I did a grief seminar, six hour seminar, ministering to these people going back. The guts is written out. One church of uh, 45,000 people lost, uh, and one church of 10,000 lost 45 people. Christians. If I was to put the photos up of the beautiful the teenagers and musicians, you'd cry. Yeah. But listen, never lose your passion. I remember when I started out, I ordered two books and I started out, and he's a good man. You know, Paul, uh, Phil Pringle. And he sort of intimated that King had lost and fallen down on a tree because I'm a faith preacher. I want to tell you what, you come to me, you sit down. And you know I'm going to keep doing it. Because it helps people. It helps people. People need that workable keys. And so that what's going to put an attractiveness about your ministry It's not only worship, it's you having a passion to the progress. Don't leave it to your pastor. He can't do it. Impossible, time-wise. Or I cultivate a passion to the brokenness of humanity. This church could go to other levels. You could be one sound in that. You know Phil, don't you? One day, Phil, I, I love, he's a generous man. And one day, he gets up Sunday morning, he notices a couple in the church, and he says to Someone I was past him. What are they doing here? They were married yesterday. That should be a church, it should be money. And it was whispered into Phil's ear, haven't got any money. And Phil gets up and he didn't have money, he borrows a hundred dollars from someone in the front row. And he puts it on, on the on the table. He says, Listen, we're gonna bless these people. And within moments people came up and another someone threw the keys of a brand new car to victory. You know, I want to tell you what, what will that do? One day, it was in the papers of a, of a, a girl that needed two hip replacements. 
didn't have any money and hit the press. And so Phil was sent to his past, one of his past, bring up that phone, that family, and he rang them up. And they, they, they said, this is a sick joke. And slammed the receiver down. Because they said, we want to help you. And they persisted, took an offering, and they rebuilt those two hips. And you know what? It hit the press. And wheels within wheels. Now, folks, we might never be able to do all that. But oh, never lose your passion. Never lose your, your passion for prayer. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. My wife, she, you never say no to John. And uh, there was a young boy, he, he was in the wrong. And in our church, how old was he? How old was he? 19. He had a motorbike. So he was in the wrong. And he lost his leg. And you know, the judgment people said, oh, serves right. And she just kept pulling my coattail. She said, we need to take it off. I said, John, there's too many, too many needs in the church. But she wouldn't take no for an answer. And I said, okay. You come and talk to the eldership. And she did. So she came in in a very resolute way. And she needed some money from the first part of the operation to go down for an experiment in Sydney. One guy said, I'll give seven. You know, it was interesting running the eldership. And the same thing, oh, you know, we can't afford it. So and so and so and so. But you know, and that's the woman mind. That's the intellectual mind. And the short of it is, we go took some money. And then I got John up to speak in the church. And we, at that juncture, we got more than we needed. And it just shows me this. She is that people have hearts that minister. Can anyone say that? I know I'm bringing this to a conclusion. And I want to say this, dear friends. Uh, you know, never lose your passion. Your number five, stay within your gift. Why am I saying that? Bones, 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 a dryness and negativity. And those things can crack a person spirit if they don't have a gift. Some people have a gift of mercy. They can go stay in a hospital for hours. I go on for two minutes an hour again. It's not my gift. My wife can stay hour up there holding people's hands as they pass from this life. I'm not, I'm not making it up. I tell you, I go and pray for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It's on my gift. And honestly, I'm a compassionate person. Stay in your gift. Some of you have got prayer. You can pray when the cows come home. Hey, that's your gift. The house feeds it. Some of you have a gift to make money. That's your gift. Some of you have worship. That's your gift. Stay in your gift. And listen, it's important when you're out of your gift, you're going to break down. Did you know here in Australia, 13,000 pastors have went to the ministry? 1,000 pastors as I speak, as I speak, are being rebuilt here in Australia. And sometimes it's because they're out of their gift. If you stay in your gift, hey, it's easy. Man, I can preach five meetings a day and still go. Why? Because God gifted me. He gave me the gift. Talk to me, it's lonely. You're a wonderful group of people. All right, I know you are. Stay in your gift. Don't, don't try to steal a gift from someone else. Whatever you're called to do, do it. And do it well. Number six. Know your inheritance. Now, where, where do I get this point? God said to the prophet, He said, Can these bones live? And some of you people dig around in the Hebrew and, and, and it reads like this. You know that I know these bones show me. You know, you know it that I know. And folk, if you believe in your product, I've just started a, a diet sort of thing. And I'm going to sell it. The reason, because it works. I lost 15 cables, bigger boy than that. That's why I said, John, join these trousers. <laughs> and I could, and I was out there. And I was 15 kgs in, in, in a month. But you see, it works. I, I, I can get involved in something that works. I'll tell you what it is. Oh, I'm not saying this. All right. Because you think I'm here to sell some living problems? No, you inheritance. And I want to say that my last point, and the seventh point is this, if we have a couple of musicians, 
please. Prophesy your dream. Number seven, you're writing down. Prophesy your dream. God said to Ezekiel, he says, prophesy to the bones. I want to tell you what, never lose your dream. Dear friends, the devil's going to try and kill your dream. He's going to try and kill everything about your life. But don't you look at these wonderful people writing and goodness sake, you hardly ever get that in churches today. You know. I mean, but you hardly know it. But look at their Bibles, look at the scripture, this guy here, all these little notes. An email, copy of an email, not good. But I want to tell you this, honey, don't you lose your dream. Don't you lose your dream. You can still touch the hem of his garment for you and the half of those in your circle around about you. And you can bless, you can touch the hem of his garment for your lineage. Hallelujah. I mean, don't lose it. Don't let the devil knock it off. Let's all stand, shall we? Do you love the Lord today? Do you believe that you were made for great things? Do you believe the Spirit of God, the head of the mighty God, is upon your life? Do you believe it? You know, do you believe that you could be part of something that's has a great destiny. Yeah. 